to sit here and ask me such one-dimensional questions about a very tiny area of our lives. You ask me questions that fall continually within the negroness of my life. I am artist, man, American. I am an awful lot of things, so I wish you would uh, pay me the respect. He meant everything to me. I mean, he was a, a positive example of elegance and good taste. Uh, he was a source of pride. And I can honestly say that the reason I'm up here today is because of Sidney Poitier, because of the time he, he gave me, the advice he gave me, the example he provided for me. It appears that Tyler Perry has found himself in another sticky situation, stirring up gossip in the entertainment world. Rumors are swirling, comparing him to the legendary Sidney Poitier. Some voices are suggesting that Sidney set the gold standard for black actors, while Perry is being labeled as nothing more than a sellout. So let's get into it and see how exactly was Sidney Poitier different from Tyler Perry. You see, Sidney Poitier refused to be defined by race from the start of his decades-long career, but his best-known performances advanced the depiction of black actors and pushed audiences to confront racial tensions in America. Racism is painful, and we have to be clear-eyed about it, not just victims of it. And on the other side, victims of racism are charged with the responsibility to have as clear an eye as they can to examine what they perceive to be the sources of racism, the legendary actor told the Vancouver Sun in 2000. Racial tensions in the South initially came as a shock for Poitier when he arrived in Florida to live with relatives at the age of 14 in the 1940s. Growing up on Cat Island, Island in the Bahamas, his identity had never been linked to skin color, and he quickly pushed against that idea. I couldn't go into certain stores and try on a pair of shoes. I had to travel in the back of a bus and I had never had to do that before. It was a big disappointment to me, Poitier said on CNN's Larry King Live in 2008. Before I got to Florida, I had the opportunity through my mother and my dad to have set some kind of foundation as to who I was, he told Oprah Winfrey in a 2000 interview. I was not what I was required to be in Florida. I was not that. I couldn't be that. I was taught that I had basic rights as a human being. I was taught that I was someone. I knew we had no money. Still, I was taught that I was someone. We had no electricity and no running water. Still, I was taught that I was someone. I had very little education. A year and a half, in fact, was all the schooling I was exposed to. Still, I knew that I was someone, he added. In a 2000 interview for The Observer, Poitier said being a Hollywood star did not shield him from the struggles a black man in America had to face in the 1950s and 1960s. I I had to think twice or three times about every step I took, Poitier said. I was in a culture that denied me my very existence, and I had no forces behind me. When I walked the streets outside of the neighborhood which I was confined to, I had to be constantly on the alert. The America I am speaking of was a different place back then. The dominant culture did not care about my survival as a human being. For a dark-skinned actor like Poitier, finding complex roles in the 1950s was difficult. Blacks were so new in Hollywood. There was almost no frame of reference for us except as stereotypical, one-dimensional characters," Poitier told Winfrey. I had in mind what was expected of me, not just what other blacks expected but what my mother and father expected, and what I expected of myself. As he cemented his place in American cinema with films like Lilies of the Field, which earned him an Oscar, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Poitier was fully aware many people of color, including viewers and fellow artists, looked up to him. It's been an enormous responsibility, Poitier told Winfrey, and I accepted it and I lived in a way that showed how I respected that responsibility. I had to. In order for others to come behind me, there were certain things I had to do. Poitier was also known for his activism and how he embraced the civil rights movement. In 1963, he attended the March on Washington, and in 1964, the actor traveled to Mississippi to meet with activists in the days following the infamous slayings of three young civil rights workers. The nature of my life over the last 36 years has been such that the urgency that was evident today has been bubbling in me personally for most of these years, at least most of the years I came into adulthood. I became interested in the civil rights struggle out of a necessity to survive, Poitier said during a round table with other March on Washington participants and filmed in 1963. I found it necessary for self-protection and to perpetuate my survival that I involve myself in any activity that would ease my burden momentarily, he said about his decision to attend the march. But despite his activism, some people felt that Sidney was typecast into controversial roles. For starters, it is important to mention that more than any other African-American actor, Poitier helped to integrate Hollywood. 
He was the first African American to win a Best Actor Academy Award for his performance in Lilies of the Field. Despite the acclaim he received, he was not universally admired by African Americans. The black critic and playwright Clifford Mason famously denounced him as dishonest in a New York Times article. Why does white America love Sidney Poitier so? In September 10, 1967, he said, I submit that the N, or black if you will, image was subverted in these films much more so than it was in the two films he seems worried about. Playing Porgy and Porgy and Bess was one of the roles that concerned Poitier, supposedly accepting it against his better judgment as the price for being allowed to play such roles as the heroic Virgil Tibb in In the Heat of the Night. What Mason liked about the Porgy character was that, quote unquote, at least we have a man, a real man, fighting for his woman and willing to follow her into the great unknown, the big city, poor boy from Catfish Row that he is. But he remains unreal, Mason continued, as he has for nearly two decades, playing essentially the same role, the antiseptic, one dimensional hero. The critic was disappointed that the Virgil Tibbs character had no apparent love interest to certify him as a real man. Furthermore, he minimized the significance of the famous slap which Tibbs gives a white bigot, complaining that it occurs only after the bigot slaps Tibbs first. All in all, Poitier was criticized for being typecast as over-idealized African-American characters who were not permitted to have any sexuality or personality fault, such as his character in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Poitier was aware of this pattern himself, but was was conflicted on the matter. In any case, Poitier was an inspiration to many actors today who have also chosen not to conform to Hollywood standards, and one of them is Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington's heartfelt tribute to Sidney Poitier at the AFI Life Achievement Awards in 1992 exemplifies the profound impact Poitier had on aspiring actors, particularly within the African-American community. Washington's recollection of his first encounter with Poitier illustrates the profound admiration and respect he held for the legendary actor. Actor. He turned around and uh, <laughs> turned around and said, "How are you?" I said, "I'm, I'm Denzel Washington. You don't you don't know me. I haven't I haven't done anything." But. Uh, he was very kind to me. What stands out in Washington's tribute is the emphasis on Poitier's willingness to offer guidance and support without expecting anything in return. Unlike some Hollywood elites who might use their status to maintain exclusivity or to perpetuate a sense of hierarchy, Poitier approached mentoring with generosity and humility. I did what any friend would do, any actor would do. I took out my picture and resume, started begging for a job. He didn't give me a job. <laughs> That city, you, you've never given me a job. But he did something that was much more important. He gave me his time, his advice. And I can honestly say that the reason I'm up here today is because of Sidney Poitier. Washington's mention of Poitier not offering him a job, but instead providing invaluable time and advice, highlights Poitier's commitment to fostering talent and creating opportunities without the expectation of personal gain. Poitier's actions demonstrate a departure from the typical gatekeeping behavior seen in many industries, including Hollywood, where access to opportunities often hinges on personal connections or favors owed. Additionally, another actor who was not only inspired by Sidney, but also claimed that the actor saved him was Jamie Foxx. Jamie Fox Fox has been an entertainment mainstay for decades now, with an Oscar and a Grammy under his belt as well as a best-selling memoir. But in an interview with Access Hollywood's Scott Evans, Fox revealed that his career very nearly took a different turn until Sidney Poitier stepped in to give him some advice. In 2005, Fox was riding high from the critical acclaim he garnered for his performance as Ray Charles in the musical biopic Ray, a role for which he would eventually win the Academy Award for Best Actor. But his celebrating had turned into non-stop partying. When Winfrey took notice of this and called him up out of the blue. Jamie Foxx, who's this? This is Oprah. You're blowing it, Jamie Foxx. Oh, really? I said, what do you mean? She says, all of this gallivant and all this kind of that's not what you want to do. Winfrey took Fox to the home of record producer Quincy Jones, where an impromptu intervention had been set up. Doing an uncanny impersonation of Jones, Fox remembers being told, you've done a great job on Ray, but you've effed everything else up now. You gotta buckle down, baby. He continues, Oprah says, now, are you ready to meet the person that I have brought you here to talk with? And it was Sidney Poitier. He says, I saw you one time. You were at a party. Do you remember that? I was like, yes, tears. And he says, when I watched your performance, it made me 
grow artistically two inches. And I give something to you. I give you responsibility that from now on throughout your career, you'll be responsible for what you give and what you show. And I have done as best I can to sort of live up to that because it is very important. Poitier, unlike Tyler Perry, was instrumental in building Jamie's career. On the other hand, Tyler has displayed a negative example for other black actors, such as emasculating black male actors by wearing dresses. You see, Tyler's role as Medea has garnered so much critic from other male actors who claim that wearing a dress is a humiliating ritual put in place by Hollywood elites as a rite of passage for any actor who wants to be successful. Several male actors, including Jamie Foxx, Martin Lawrence, and Kevin Hart, have followed in Perry's footsteps and donned dresses while playing roles of black women. You see, in a 2006 interview with Oprah, the comedian shared a story about refusing to do a scene in a Martin Lawrence movie that would have required him to wear a dress. When I see that they put every black man and the movies in a dress at some point in their career. I'd be connecting them down like, why all these brothers gotta wear a dress? Despite incessant prodding by the writer, director, and producers, Dave recalled, he stood firm that he was uncomfortable with the idea and ultimately funnier than a dress. You no, know, the pressure comes in. Huh. He said, I'm, nah, I'm not wearing no dress, man. I'm funnier than a dress. Just give me something funny to say. I don't need to wear no dress to be funny. Anyway, during an appearance on T.I.'s Expeditiously podcast, Tyler Perry touched upon Dave Chappelle's long-standing criticism towards an aspect of the entertainment industry, which he believes puts black men in situations where they need to wear dresses in order to be funny. Since his character Medea made her theatrical debut in 2005's Diary of a Mad Black Woman, Perry has achieved meteoric fame and immense wealth, inked partnerships with Oprah's own network and BET, and created the 330-acre Tyler Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta, the first major film studio owned outright by a person of color. Perry's life is a success story, but it's one that has drawn scrutiny from people who believe the 50-year-old multi-hyphenate stooped to a level that Chappelle warned against. While he didn't want to engage in a discourse with Chappelle over his past remarks, Perry said that it has always been his choice to wear Medea's costume, which happens to include a dress. Listen, Chappelle is one of the most brilliant people I have ever seen in my life, not just in comedy, but the man is smart, a heavy, brilliant thing thinker, Perry said at around the 20-minute mark. So if that is the case in Hollywood, then okay, that's the case. But you gotta understand, that's not my case. Nobody owned that dress but me, he continued. Nobody told me. A $2 billion franchise, nobody told me to put it on. Nobody makes me put it on. It was all on stage. Black man owned the whole show. It was my choice. Perry explained that it was his choice to wear a dress for the first movie, and it continues to be his choice, 19 movies since then. He also believes that his portrayal of Medea should be seen as him wearing the costume of a character that has made so many people laugh and lifted their spirit. I'm not a man who enjoys wearing a dress, Perry added. For me, as an actor, it's a costume. It's like if somebody goes to work at Walmart, they put on their uniform. For me, that's putting on a uniform, going out and making people laugh, lifting them up, encouraging them, the good that it does for so many people. Anyway, apart from Poitier's success in Hollywood, another thing that inspired most people was the actor's life was a rags-to-riches story. Poitier was born in Miami on February 20th, 27. His parents, Evelyn and Reginald Poitier, were from Cat Island in the Bahamas. They were only visiting Florida to sell produce in between Reginald's job as a cab driver. Poitier was actually born two months premature and was so frail that his parents stayed in Miami for three extra months to make sure that their baby would survive. Poitier returned to Miami when he was 15 years old. A brother of his had moved there beforehand, raising a large family. Poitier stayed with them until he was 16 when he moved to New York City. When Poitier moved moved to New York City, he took work as a dishwasher in various establishments. While he did this, he also learned how to read for the first time in his life. A friendly waiter would regularly sit with him during this time and helped him read the local newspapers. Before his film career ever began, Poitier started in theater in New York City. However, it wasn't until he began practicing musical numbers that he realized he was tone deaf. Determined to refine his acting skills and rid himself of his noticeable Bahamian accent, he spent the next six months dedicating himself to achieving theatrical success. He modeled his legendary speech pattern after radio personality Norman Brokenshire. On his second attempt at the theater, he was noticed and given a leading role in the Broadway production of Lysistrata. Though it ran a failing four days, he received an invitation to understudy for Anna Lucasta. Poitier would later befriend Harry Belafonte at the American N Theater. In 1947, Poitier was a founding member of the Committee for the N in the Arts, CNA, 
Today, an organization whose participants were committed to a left-wing analysis of class and racial exploitation. Among his other CNA-related activities, in the early 1950s, he was a vice chair of the organization. In 1952, he was one of several narrators in a pageant written by Alice Childress and Lorraine Hansberry for the N History Festival, put on by the leftist Harlem monthly newspaper Freedom. His participation in such events and CNA generally, along with his friendships with other leftist black performers, including Canada Lee and Paul Robeson, led to his subsequent blacklisting for a few years. Even associating with Poitiers added to the basis for blacklisting Alfred Palka, the writer and producer of one of Poitiers' earliest films, the 1954 Go Man Go. Poitiers never did sign a loyalty oath, despite being asked in connection with his prospective role in Blackboard Jungle. By late 1949, Poitiers had to choose between leading roles on stage and an offer to work for Daryl F. Zanuck in the film No Way Out. His performance in No Way Out, as a doctor treating a white bigot played by Richard Widmark who became a friend, was noticed and led to more roles, each considerably more interesting and more prominent than those most African-American actors of the time were offered. In 1951, he traveled to South Africa with the African-American actor Canada Lee to star in the film version of Cry, The Beloved Country. Poitiers' distinction continued in his role as Gregory W. Miller, a member of an incorrigible high school class in Blackboard Jungle. But it was his performance in Martin Ritt's 1957 film Edge of the City that the industry could not ignore. It was a pitch towards stardom granted him. Poitiers enjoyed working for director William Wellman on Goodbye, My Lady. Wellman was a big name. He had previously directed the famous Roxy Hart with Ginger Rogers and Magic Town with James Stewart. What Poitiers remembered indelibly was the wonderful humanity in this talented director. Wellman had a sensitivity that Poitiers thought was profound, which Wellman felt he needed to hide. Poitiers later praised Wellman for inspiring his thoughtful approach to directing when he found himself taking the helm from Joseph Sargent on Buck and the Preacher in 1971. In 1958, he starred alongside Tony Curtis in director Stanley Kramer's The Defiant Ones. The film was a critical and commercial success with the performances of both Poitiers and Curtis being praised. The film landed eight Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor nominations for both stars, making Poitiers the first black male actor to be nominated for a competitive Academy Award as Best Actor. Poitiers did win the British Academy Film Award for Best Foreign Actor. Poitiers acted in the first production of A Raisin in the Sun alongside Ruby Dee on the Broadway stage at the Ethel Barrymore Theatre in 1959. The play was directed by Lloyd Richards. The play introduced details of black life to the overwhelmingly white Broadway audiences, while director Richards observed that it was the first play to which large numbers of black people were drawn. The play was a groundbreaking piece of American theater with Frank Rich, critic from the New York Times writing in 1983 that A Raisin in the Sun changed American theater forever. For his performance, he earned a Tony Award for Best Actor in a Play nomination. That same year, Poitiers would star in the film adaptation of Porgy and Bess alongside Dorothy Dandridge. For his performance, Poitiers received a 1960 Golden Globe Award nomination for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Musical or Comedy. In 1961, Poitiers starred in the film adaptation of A Raisin in the Sun, for which he received another Golden Globe Award nomination. Also in 1961, Poitiers starred in Paris Blues alongside Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward, Louis Armstrong, and Diane Carroll. The film dealt with the American racism of the time by contrasting it with Paris's open acceptance of black people. In 1963, he starred in Lilies of the Field. For this role, he won the Academy Award for Best Actor and became the first black male to win the award. His satisfaction at this honor was undermined by his concerns that this award was more of the industry congratulating itself for having him as a token and it would inhibit him from asking for more substantive considerations afterward. Despite his accolades, Poitiers was aware of the limitations imposed by Hollywood, often typecast as idealized African-American characters without dimension. However, his roles in films like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner challenged societal norms, depicting interracial romance in a positive light. By the 1970s, Poitiers' influence extended beyond acting. He made his directorial debut with the Western Buck and the Preacher, and co-founded the first artist production company, aiming to empower actors in the industry. Poitiers' commitment to diversity in filmmaking led him to direct and star in successful comedies like Uptown Saturday Night and Stir Crazy, showcasing his versatility as both an actor and a filmmaker. Throughout his later career, Poitiers continued to make impactful contributions to cinema, receiving numerous awards and honors, including an Honorary Academy Award in 2002 for his overall contributions to American cinema. Later during the event, Denzel Washington clinched the Best Actor Award
Award for his remarkable performance in Training Day, becoming the second black actor ever to snag this prestigious honor. In his acceptance speech, Washington paid tribute to Poitier, expressing his admiration by saying, I'll always be chasing you, Sydney. I'll always be following in your footsteps. There's nothing I would rather do, sir. Following the passing of Ernest Borgnine in 2012, Poitier became the oldest living recipient of the Academy Award for Best Actor. Then, on March 2, 2014, Poitier graced the stage alongside Angelina Jolie at the 86th Academy Awards to present the Best Director Award. His presence garnered a standing ovation, and Jolie expressed gratitude for his immense contributions to Hollywood, declaring, We are in your debt. Poitier delivered a brief speech, encouraging his fellow peers to keep up the wonderful work, receiving warm applause from the audience. In 2021, the Academy honored Poitier by dedicating the lobby of the new Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles as the Sydney Poitier Grand Lobby. All in all, Sydney Poitier's legacy as a trailblazer and advocate for representation in the film industry remains unparalleled, earning him admiration and recognition from peers and audiences alike. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.